Bonjour, Hanin Tante. Uh, my name is Angeline Nelson, and I'm the Director of uh, Community Learning and Engagement here at the University of Winnipeg. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Arcand. Um, I had the pleasure of um, getting to know her a little better this morning um, over some food and talking about um, Indigenous agriculture and about the work that she does um, in her community. And so I would just like to introduce her. Dr. Melissa Arcand is a soil uh, biogeochemist with research interests focused on understanding biological indicators um, of soil health in agricultural and natural ecosystems. Uh, she received her PhD in soil science uh, from the University of Saskatchewan, and she grew up um, on a farm on the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in central Saskatchewan. Uh, she teaches and is the academic advisor for students in the Ganewe Tetan Aski program, uh, designed to train um, Indigenous students to work um, in resource management and land governance in First Nation communities across Canada. So her emerging work uses uh, biophysical tools to examine uh, the effects of agriculture and tenure arrangements on ecosystem health on First Nations land. Um, so what was, what's really exciting to me about her is that she also recently hosted possibly the first ever um, forum on Indigenous agriculture in Saskatchewan at the U.S. Um, just I guess last month. And uh, so we were kind of talking about that a little bit and just um, you know, understanding that this forum really opened up, um, really created a lot of connections among um, Indigenous people who, um, you know, have grew up around farming, um, and we kind of shared some similar experiences um, in that aspect. And so, it is my pleasure to introduce her, and I'm very looking for, looking forward to her talk. So, thank you. All right. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks everyone for uh, coming on this really cold day to uh, listen to me talk about some of my work. Um, I'm really thankful to uh, the organizers uh, and, and for, for you to invite me to this talk. I looked at the previous speakers who've done this seminar series in the past and I thought, wow, this is a pretty heavy hitter group of people. Some, some folks that I consider mentors um, have spoke here before. So I'm very honored to be here um, and excited to share with you some of the, the things I've been thinking about and some of the work that I'm doing and, and really some of the work that I hope that, that, we can, that I can do along with um, some, some community partners. Um, so the title of my talk, I'm going to bungle this because I'm still also a language learner, is Nisto Tamoin Askik Ochi. And what that means in Plains Cree is understanding from the land. And, and so what I'm really interested in as a, as a natural scientist and a, a soil scientist is, um, is, is engaging more, uh, I guess, more wholly in what that understanding is and, and where that understanding can come from, both from a Western science, but also from indi indigenous knowledge systems. But how can we use the, these knowledge systems to then apply to contemporary um, land management in, within the context of, of First Nations communities? So I'd come up with this title quite a long time ago and wasn't really, uh, you know, kind of having title regret a little bit. But, um, but, but when he, I guess, you know, the term biophysical, uh, you know, is, is in that title. So I wanted to just touch on, you know, what, what do I mean, you know, as a natural scientist, what do we think about when we're thinking about, about biophysical? Um, and really, in, at least from, from my perspective, um, you know, kind of think about biophysical environments as, as also, you know, ecosystems. It is, you know, the components of our environment, both living and non-living that interact with each other, that share physical space, that connect uh, through movement. Um, you know, if you think about water, moving through landscapes, um, but also the, the transference of energy and nutrients among these different components of the environment. So when I think about biophysical, that's what I'm thinking about. What are the components of, 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 of the environment? How, how are they interacting with each other? Um, so then getting to, okay, well what, are, well, what are biophysical tools? Again, from you know, my natural science background in the context of the soil science work that I do, you know, these biophysical tools relate to you know, the techniques, the methods, um, you know, literally the equipment that we use to collect data 
about our biophysical environment. So, um, in, especially in, the, in, you know, in, in my field, in, in soil science, we go out, we collect soils, we collect plants, we bring them back to the lab, and then we you know, study, study them to death. Um, but really, you know, what's important to think about is we, we do this in, 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 the, in the sense of we want to understand how these interactions between, uh, you know, the components of the environment are occurring. We want to understand how they behave under certain types of conditions. So we want to know, well, how do, how do human decisions impact those parts of the, parts of the ecosystem in terms of, of, you know, functioning, in terms of being able to provide, um, you know, both humans and non-humans with healthy food, healthy water, et cetera. Um, but we're also really interested in, you know, how do natural disturbances affect processes and affect these components of the environment? So, for example, things like fire, like drought, like flood, how does that impact, you know, these, these components? Um, and then, of course, you know, something really important is how does climate change um, impact the, these interactions and, and the functioning of these ecosystems? Um, so I'm not going to go too you know, go down that path too much, but something, you know, again, even that the term biophysical is a really kind of Western type of word, and, you know, we think about, well, I've already kind of talked about these, you know, how do we sample, how do we sample things, how do we measure things, how do we look at data, how, we, how do we make sense of that data using, using quantitative statistics, and we're, you know, sort of following the scientific method in doing so, and then we're communicating our results in peer-reviewed journals, um, but, which also, you know, we would, we would, we would do extension to, um, you know, farmers, for example, in the context of my work, to land managers, you know, there's knowledge technology transfer that happens. And, and hopefully, you know, some of the work that we do is going to inform policy and, and decision making. So, you know, that's all happening uh, within the context of, of my work. Um, but I also think a lot about, okay, well, what is the indigenous, you know, quote unquote, biophysical toolbox? Um, you know, where does this, you know, sort of concept of understanding from the land come from? You know, it's, it's relationship based, it's connection through participation in the land. Obviously, um, you know, many of the relationships would be considered sacred. Um, and transference of knowledge would be intergenerational and, and land based. Um, and so, you know, this concept of traditional ecological knowledge uh, comes into play. And of course, you know, something that I think about too is how do those knowledges, how are those knowledges embedded in language systems? Um, and again, sort of that transfer of knowledge through about the environment and our understanding of ecological relationships. How is that inherently embedded in, in the language? Um, and so, you know, sadly, we know through... <laughs> colonization um, and you know more and as well recently through um, through residential schools for many indigenous people this this knowledge has been disrupted uh, it's fragmented and, and for a lot of people you know erased um, and obviously that has major consequences you know we can talk about that for days um, but I'm wanted to kind of talk about it in the context of, of natural resource management um, and so one thing that I'm really interested in, um, you know, as a, as a Western scientist, you know, as a natural scientist using Western tools, um, how can I work with, with communities who are really interested in, in reclaiming indigenous knowledges um, in the context of, of making land management decisions and, and being able to advocate on their, on their behalf um, in terms of any kind of natural resource development? Um, how, can we, how, how can we use all of the tools at our disposal? Um, to to be able to um, to make decisions that are uh, you know that are appropriate uh, within the context of your own community, and so what I'm going to do is um, talk about this sort of using agriculture as a case study um, because I'm from Saskatchewan. I grew up on a farm. Um, most reserves anywhere south of the boreal forest uh, have agriculture, and so I'm going to sort of frame my discussion around around this, around agriculture. So I've already kind of said this, you know, agriculture, it is predominant in, in the prairies. We know this, you, you know, walk uh, flying over, even, even, in, even in the middle of the winter, you can tell, you know, that the landscape is, is dotted with, um, 
is covered with, with farms. Um, and so, you know, I usually talk about this in the context of Saskatchewan, but when you expand out to Manitoba and Alberta, you know, the extent of agricultural production is, is absolutely massive. Um, but we often don't think about agriculture as it relates to Indigenous people and ind Indigenous communities. Um, does anyone know any Indigenous farmers? Does anyone know maybe retired farmers or, or of, you know, ancestors that may have been? So a couple. So there's a few sort of in, in, in this room that, that kind of are connected to that. Um, but where do, so where do Indigenous people fit in, in the story of prairie agriculture? And it's rather complex, and I'm going to sort of get out of my science role and pretend that I'm a sort of hack historian for a bit, and, um, and talk a little bit about sort of the history of Indigenous agriculture. Um, actually, but let's just get back to my soil science roots here and, um, and talk about, you know, the reason why... Uh, the prairies are such a bread box is because we have beautifully rich productive soil and the reason why we have beautifully rich productive soil is because our soils in this area were developed under natural native grasslands and those grasslands the grasses have extensive root systems they're perennial um, and unlike trees grass roots are very fine, and they can contribute organic matter to the soil continuously. And what organic matter does is it, number one, it contains nutrients, so nutrients that plants need. Um, but number two, it also, they also contain carbon. And soil organic matter is really high in carbon, and carbon is energy. And it's energy that fuels all of the biotic processes that are necessary to transform nutrients into forms that plants can take up. So you can think about organic matter um, as being kind of a, a, a power, like a powerhouse of energy and, and, and nutrients. And then in the context of a, of a native ecosystem, there's really, really, really tight cycling that occurs between living and dead, living and dead, nutrients um, coming from the soil into, into plants. Um, but how this sort of connects to Indigenous agriculture is that um, Indigenous people that lived on this land were, were very knowledgeable and connected to these cycles, um, as well as, you know, um, we weren't aim wandering aimlessly across the prairie. There was intentionality in our interactions with the environment. And that includes, you know, a you know, specific example would be the use of prescribed fire. So, in, in, you know, in, in, in um, burning the prairie of Rensen Well, that would rejuvenate the vegetation that bison would be able to feed upon. Bison are pooping all over the place, putting organic matter and rich nutrients back onto the land. Um, there was, you know, this sort of, sort of kind of agriculture in a way, in the, in the sense that there was some deliberate decisions being made. Um, and so, you know, when I talk with, um, with, with elders and other, other community members who are more kind of connected to traditional, uh, to, to sort of traditional understanding, you know, they kind of make that argument, you know, well, we kind of were doing agriculture. It's just sort of, you got to kind of shift your, your thinking about what agriculture means. Um, but if you, if you look at, um, so this map here is showing sort of the extent of, uh, especially maize production in, in the, you know, Central and, and North America, um, and, and sort of the spread northward of, of maize as, it, as it's moved throughout uh, North America. And you can see there's this, you know, little spot right where we're standing where maize would have been cultivated prior to um, European contact and settlement. And so even though, you know, me in Saskatchewan over here may not have had the right climate conditions to grow maize, my ancestors certainly traded with everybody down this line, right? So there was definitely an awareness that people were 
planting seeds and, you know, selecting for beneficial traits of those plants to grow improved crops, right? So this was happening and there, you know, there's definitely, and like even in kind of where I'm from through archeological work, you know, they find stores of, of, grain, of corn. And so it got there somehow. Um, and so there's certainly transference of knowledge, um, you know, of, of those agricultural systems uh, prior to European contact. Um, so we all know, you know, settlement of the plains really meant really meant expansion of of agriculture, and coincident with that was, you know, breaking of the native prairie, um, obvious loss of huge populations of bison, um, which was an important food source. And so, in negotiations of the, you know, the treaties, and especially as you kind of go up in number of you, as you move as you move west, um, the agricultural provisions become more um, stark in, in terms of what, what the leaders were negotiating for. And so there was this awareness that, um, that there needed to be change and there needed to be adaptation to the new sort of situation on the prairies. Uh, and so, you know, agriculture was one of those important things to be, um, to be lobbied for within the treaties. And, you know, from one treaty to the next, you know, the details are different. You know, you, people learn from each other as, as they went um, over time. But nevertheless, they are an important feature of, of many of the, the numbered treaties. And early on, uh, Indigenous farmers were really successful. And you see that, and when I talk to my, um, my historian colleagues, they go back to archives, new, newspaper archives, and there's evidence for how successful um, Native farmers were. And there's a couple of reasons for this, really, for this early success. Number one, people were under, understood the ecosystems in which they were farming, so they understood the drought, drought cycles. They understood, you know, the, the the richness of the soil and how it needed to be properly maintained. Um, so there was that sort of ecological knowledge, but there was also a cultural aspect to this. So some of the you know, when, I, when I've heard stories about what was happening back then and, and as to, you know, why things then changed is that part of the reason why Native farmers were so successful is they were really good at working communally together. So, for example, you know, all these pictures show modern farm equipment um, and, and uh, you know, so they're adapting modern practice. But one of the things that they, that they did often is that they shared these tools and they shared the work in, involved. Um, and so, you know, you could buy the fanciest, biggest tractor around because you were pooling your resources um, and then also pooling sort of the knowledge about that, those agricultural systems uh, together. But at this time, there was, there was not the big push to disrupt the um, indigenous knowledge that was inherent to being able to be successful in, in these landscapes. Um, have, have people read Lost Harvest by Sarah Carter? Has anyone read the book? It's a really, really great um, historical account of how essentially government policy across the prairies um, affected First Nations agriculture. I, I really recommend it. It's a great book. Um, has, has anyone watched The Past System? Some people have. I also recommend go watch The Past System. It's a great documentary. It was made a couple of years ago. Um, uh, but essentially, kind of around the 1885 rebellion, um, the government started to get really worried about the Indians, right? And at the same time, First Nations people were doing great at agriculture. They were competing on, you know, in the market economy and doing really well. Um, and folks didn't like that. And so along with, you know, the rebellion that occurred, the government was clamping down much harder on, um, uh, on the movement of First Nations people. And so what ended up happening is, you know, we were more and more confined to our reserves. Um, so one thing that, well, I'll, I'll kind of go through these really quick, quickly, but there's something called the peasant farm policy, which essentially um, restricted First Nations people from using modern farm equipment. 
had to go back to using the hose and you know the wooden the wooden tools etc even though they'd been using massey ferguson's for you know maybe a decade or so um, so, so restricting the use of modern farm equipment. It was also illegal for them to for um, for them to sell. Well, for uh, uh, farm um, supply companies to sell to the, the native population. So, um, so there was that, and then there was the pass and permit system. So the pass system relates to restricting movement off of the reserve. And, uh, and along with that, the permit system. But there's also a permit system that related to being able to sell your agricultural produce. So if you're trying to sell your grain or you're trying to sell your cattle or your hay, you would have to get the ag Indian agent to sign off on that. And sometimes they'd like to take a cut. So there was, that was happening. And, then, and so that would have been happening in the late 1800s all the way, um, like my Musham still has a permit. So, you know, that was happening well into the 1950s. Um, and then we obviously know, you know, the impacts of the res residential and industrial school systems, which obviously really had a major impact in that knowledge um, transference among, in, you know, intergenerations. Um, there's also uh, some really weird, messed up um, experiments in trying to establish farm colonies. And these were done uh, where... Uh, indigenous students that had gone through residential school, if any of them kind of showed promise, quote unquote, they were encouraged to uh, colonize. They were essentially shipped to another reserve. And, and at this other reserve, they were meant to start a farm colony. And so they were set up with tools and, and with the infrastructure to do that. Um, but part of that was that, you know, they, weren't, they were made to still not speak their language, um, to live a Christian lifestyle, et cetera. And that also um, was, a, was a complete failure. Um, so we have all of these farm policies that are essentially just, you know, killing agriculture um, as it's practiced by uh, indigenous people. So along with that, at the same time, you know, the railway is expanding. Um, the government is finding as many ways as they can to reduce the size of our reserves, right? So we're losing land. Uh, and something that I'm a little bit more familiar with just uh, because it affected my community is this idea of soldier settlement surrenders after World War I. So uh, the veterans, non-Indigenous veterans, um, when they came back from the war, were given land to farm to be able to continue the expansion of prairie agriculture and, and to, you know, give something to these veterans that, you know, fought off in Germany. Um, but what happened is that they were like, okay, we'll need some more land. Where can we get some land? Oh, I know. Let's take it from the, from the Indians. And, um, and, and they would purchase the land, so they wouldn't just take it. They would purchase it, um, and, and I've, I've read uh, through some specific land claims that um, are suggesting that the Indian agents were trying to, uh, you know, sort of promoting this idea of like, okay, well, you know, we'll pay you, and then you can take that money and can use it to go buy the farm equipment that we've been withholding from you um, so that you can now farm the land that's left over, right? So it was pretty shady um, what happened there. Okay, so I'm just gonna try to show what this kind of looks like and give you a specific example. So this little area right here is where my community is. And it's just north of Saskatoon, so it's, it's, it's still in the, um, it's in the Aspen Parkland, so still really good agricultural land. Um, and so this is a map that, um, Actually, one of my professor emeritus from the soil science department, he loves maps and he was pulling out, he found all these maps, some of which are digitized, so you know, they're available. But what was interesting is I'm gonna just kind of focus in on these two parcels of land here. So this is my reserve and this is our neighboring reserve. And this map is from 1888. So you can see, you know, they're, we're happy neighbors together. This is a more, kind of fast forward a little bit, 1915, the wor First World War isn't over yet. And again, we've got our, this is, this is my reserve right here. This is our neighbors. Again, we're still happy neighbors. Um, 
And this is sort of before the end of the Second World War. And each teeny little square is a section of land, so that's 640 acres. Okay. Now, fast forward, the red boxes, this is my reserve here. This is our neighbor reserve. We've lost, we lost about 27,000 acres between the two reserves, um, no longer connected. And there's, there's lots of dispute about this and it's in the court system right now. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of depart a little bit, and then I'll come back to that. So in the 1960s, um, most of the reserves in Saskatchewan um, had their soil surveyed. And so this is not a legal survey. This is a biophysical survey. So um, um, in Saskatchewan, we were home to a very, very active um, pedology center. So th these are folks that actually went out and soil, did soil surveys. And so what they did is they'd go out take samples, characterize the soil, and then assign, you know, a class or a name to that soil. So we were able to basically come up with types, soil types. Um, and so this happened in the, in, from 1966 to 1969. And so while they're naming soils based on their soil properties, they're also assigning an agricultural capability to those soils. So how, how can those soils support agriculture production? So they're, so they're doing this at the same time. Now I should mention, so this map here, this is of my community, Muskeg Lake, and so this would have been just a scan of the paper copy from 1967. And so each kind of one of these polygons represent a unique soil type. So, um, so I'll just kind of focus in on this one here. So this is all this land would, you would very likely find similar soil properties within that map unit. Um, and so at the same time in the 1960s in Saskatchewan, the rural, rural municipalities were also getting their soil survey. So this wasn't just focused on the reserves, it was all across um, Saskatchewan. Um, so last year, a colleague of mine um, developed a digital soil information system for Saskatchewan, and so they digi digitized all of this information, which is awesome. It means like it's freely available, it's at our fingertips, we can go in, we can look at it. And so, so what do you do? You, you do that, right? Um, and so this is, you know, if you go back to that like long, kind of skinny, skinny piece of land, you know, what it looks like in sort of the digitized form, I just took a screenshot, it's this red, this red piece here. And so the purple is, is the reserve boundaries. And again, you, it just sort of different colors just indicate different soil type. Nothing really complicated about that. Um, so, okay, well, what do land surrenders have to do with soil? Um, well, everything. <laughs> Uh, okay, so as I mentioned, the land was classified in terms of its agricultural capability. And so again, each one of these polygons are associated with different agricultural land capability classes. So the lower the number, so class one land would, would be the most um, highest quality, most able to support productive agriculture, and this is cash crops, you know, canola, wheat, barley, Etc. Um, as you go lower, uh, higher in number, um, the agricultural cap capability starts declining. And so kind of around class four, class five, that would be, you would no longer be growing crops, you'd be grazing cattle or you'd be growing hay for pasture, it's perennial, um, much more marginal land, and, and so on. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, so these are our two reserves. Here's my reserve, here's Mr. Wasis. That was the original, that was our original land base, right? Well, where's the best land? It's the land that we lost, <laughs> you know? And, and everybody knew that, you know, you don't, at the time, you didn't need a map to show it. But when you see it on a map, it becomes really clear. Um, and so, you know, we've got, we lost, like our reserve lost all this, good land, and even all of this, that's class two land, that's prime agricultural land. Similarly up here, Mr. Wasis, they lost a bunch of good agricultural land. And so, you know, yeah, soil science actually does kind of contribute to this, you know, concept of land tenure and, you know, land um, expropriation. 
Um, so, you know, there's like a really sort of obvious clear connection. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist, it takes a soil scientist to get this together. Um, but yeah, highest quality land was surrendered. So something else, so what, the, what, did, what do these land surrenders do? Well, number one, they reduce the total reserve land base. They reduce the high quality agricultural land base. But remember how I said the veterans, the non-indigenous veterans, you know, they got the land that was expropriated, well, sold. Um, but there was First Nations veterans as well. Well, what land did they get? They got the land in the reserve. And so what that means, and, and this, this idea of, um, of individual uh, First Nations people holding land, it's called certificate of possession. It's the closest you can get to fee simple land ownership. Um, you still don't own the land, so you can't sell it. You can sell it to another band member, but you can never sell it off, off to anyone else. Um, but you can make decisions about that land. And so if you can imagine, You've got this reserve that's now smaller. So it's now smaller. And then you've got a bunch of veterans coming back that are now able to essentially purchase land within their reserve. Well, what land do you think they're going to purchase? They're going to purchase the rest of this best land right here. And that's exactly what happened. So then you get, then you get community members. Like the, the, These lands were supposed to be managed communally, right? So then you get some community members that have great agricultural land, and then some community members, because you know, their father didn't go to the First World War, can no longer benefit um, from that land. And so it obviously creates discord within communities. Um, and so my musha, my grandpa, was a veteran. And so you know, we were kind of the, one of the lucky ones. So like, I grew up in this good, this good class two land over here. But even in spite of that, you know, there was still a lot of barriers that even, you know, the most advantaged of uh, First Nations people were able to sort of benefit from, or, you know, even, you know, we were benefiting, but there were still a lot of challenges. So this is a newspaper article from 1965, and it's um, about my, my grandfather. And so it says, so here's a, a challenge that still remains. Um, so this Quote right here, the Indian cannot offer to mortgage the land he farms as security for a loan because he cannot own and get title to reserve land. He can only get a certificate of possession from the band for farm land. And so under these circumstances, the Indian is handicapped in obtaining farm credit and has no alternative to getting a small farming operation underway, da 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 So basically inability to get credit. If you don't have credit, you can't buy equipment. Um, so, so there was still a lot of, of challenges in trying to, you know, pursue agriculture, um, even well past the, you know, pass and permit systems and peasant farm systems, etc. Um, but you know what? People persevered. They found ways. They made good relationships with the credit union, and so even though they couldn't actually offer land up as collateral, they had reputations that they could you know, sort of leverage. And so that's what, that's what people kind of did and, and worked together and worked with, you know, brothers, cousins, et cetera, to, to keep things going. And so, you know, there was a, quite a lot of resilience in spite of, in spite of the, a lot of these barriers. Um, but you know what, a lot of these barriers still remain. So as I mentioned, sort of um, inability to obtain credit is still a, a major issue uh, that affects people today. So, and, you know, lack of financial and training support programs that are, you know, specifically targeted towards the unique sort of political economic circumstances of First Nations communities. And often if programs might be, exist, you can kind of cobble together, you know, support in some way. Often these aren't necessarily advertised or targeted towards um, uh, First Nations people. And because there's less program support, First Nations farmers that do undergo um, agriculture are often exposed to greater uh, financial risk. So for example, when um, the, the BSC uh, crisis hit, so the mad cow disease, it disproportionately affected Indigenous farmers because even though there were programs, they, they couldn't access them. And so a lot of farmers went out of farming because of that. 
Um, and so as a result, they're just, over time, there's just fewer First Nations farmers. I mean, we know across the prairies, there are fewer and fewer farmers because farms are getting bigger and bigger, but this is sort of exacerbated when you, on, on reserve, when you kind of layer it with all of these other political, social, economic factors. Um, and so I'd also argue that the challenges now, you know, we've, we had, um, you know, financial challenges, even just, you know, land, you know, reducing our land challenges, but I think, you know, challenges are, are even kind of deeper. So, you know, these historical barriers and these inequities create negative perspectives within indigenous communities, uh, on, uh, you know, with respect to agriculture. Um, so, and youth are really disconnected from agriculture. It's something that um, Angela and I were talking about this morning is like, yeah, we remembered big gardens growing up. Um, you know, even like, well, in my community, because my parents still farmed, even like folks who didn't farm, they still had big gardens and that doesn't happen anymore. So youth are really disconnected from agriculture. And we know, you know, relationships with rural settler communities are really quite strained, especially in Saskatchewan right now, after, you know, the murder of Colton Bushy, that's, that's really sort of exacerbated, um, exacerbated some of those tensions. And so this, you know, sort of harkens back to that idea of, um, you know, indigenous knowledge systems um, being, being disruptive and how that, you know, is, is impacting, you know, what could have been indigenous agriculture. Oh man, I'm talking too, too much. Okay, um, anyway, so this, this um, came up uh, in, I host, we hosted an indigenous agriculture forum right before Christmas. And so one of the participants um, sort of wrote this up. And they said, um, you know, lost generations anywhere between two to three with no connection to the land. Agricultural lifestyle um, that will take time, one or more generations to revive. And I think that's so, so clear and so, so obvious. Um, but it's, you know what, I, I'm going to argue that it's really important that we revitalize that for, uh, I would say, our important reasons. So, um, so agriculture on reserve, you know, we go back to my little red square. The yellow squares are lands that have been purchased since the 1990s through treaty land entitlement. So we're getting land back. Sadly, we purchased land that we sold, but reg regardless, we are getting, you know, more, more land. Um, and so estimates from, you know, the early 2000s in Saskatchewan that we had about 1.75 million acres of agricultural land. Now it's estimated that it could be about 4 million. And this is under conventional agriculture production um, as well as, as ranching. Um, so these numbers are increasing. Um, with these increases in acres in, in, that, we, that we hold, so this is just an example from Saskatoon Tribal Council, seven First Nations, huge increases in acres, but also increases in the quality of land too, which is great. It means like, you know, leaders were purchasing the right land, uh, which is awesome. But what's happening is that we've got more agricultural land to manage, fewer indigenous farmers, and something that comes up is concerns over leasing to non-indigenous farmers. Um, there's, you know, anecdotally, lots of stories about not receiving fair market value for rented land. There's concerns about sustainable agricultural practices and potential effects on water quality, biodiversity, et cetera. And, you know, where there is sort of, and where inequ inequities exist, especially in receiving low rental rates for land and where land governance capacity might be low, um, you know, we're essentially having modern day land surrenders. So if you're paying, you know, $10 an acre to rent land that should be probably about 60, you know, that's almost like you, you didn't even have to kick us off the land. We'll just come and we'll farm it anyway. Um, and so, so that's kind of, you know, a concern that's come up. So last week, I'll power through this, um, or sorry, last month we hosted a two-day uh, forum uh, predominantly attended by First Nations, uh, representing, um, you know, Treaty 4, Treaty 5, Treaty 6 First Nations across Saskatchewan. Um, and so we discussed, you know, what are people doing within their communities? So what are practitioners doing? What are farmers doing? What are land managers doing on the ground? Uh, and we, so we discussed, you know, what are some successful strategies for managing relationships with non-Indigenous farmers? And we heard from some from really brilliant ideas of how they are sort of gaining more control over their lands. We talked about band-run farms, land governance, community-based food security. We heard from a lot of communities that are re 
introducing bison, which is really cool. Um, talked about traditional food co uh, cultivation, technical tools and training, capacity building. Um, so after some discussion, we had some focus groups um, and did, did collect some data. Some themes really emerged, but I'm just going to focus in on the ones that really, really had a lot of discussion around was indigenous knowledge, reclaiming um, indigenous practices related to food cultivation, sustainability, so even within the context of conventional agriculture, and then capacity building was probably the number one thing um, in terms of training, engaging youth, etc. So just sort of that intersection, getting back to biophysical. So it, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a land manager who's negotiating with farmers, there's a lot of conventional data that you need to be able to understand to make sure that, you're, you know, that the land is managed properly. And this can relate from you know, even just simple, like what is the crop yielding to um, you know, what might be the best pest management um, system to implement. Uh, and a big thing that comes up a lot with the land managers that I work with is data, is record keeping, because there can be turnover in staffing. And as, you know, if we have that information, if we know what the farmer has been doing for the last 10 years, we're going to be that much better off in making future decisions. Um, and another thing that came up again is what can we learn from traditional forms of indigenous agriculture to improve contemporary practice? Can we sort of, you know, think back to what our ancestors would have done had they been able to pursue agriculture in their own way? You know, so is there a pathway forward? And can, you know, can we sort of be innovators to the other, you know, parts of the agricultural uh, community. Um, so my last thing is, you know, um, it, it'll be really important for communities to revitalize their own traditional relationships to the land, and, and that's, you know, that's within the community. But as a scientist, I, you know, I feel my job is to really promote natural science and other forms of STEM education so that at least, you know, if we're training land managers who are having to be able to read a soil test, I want them to understand that N stands for nitrogen, you know? And so, so I think it's really important that we engage Indigenous students in, in these fields. Um, and so my last thing, um, so I teach within a land management program, uh, Kanawe Titana Ski. It's a certificate program. We train Indigenous students from across, uh, across Canada. Most are mature students. Most go back to their communities and work as land managers. Um, here are two of my students from a couple years ago. And uh, one thing I always get my students to do when they're coming, um, I, before they come, I have them bring soil from their home community. And, um, and we do a bunch of soil tests. And inevitably, every single student so far from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta, they all bring agricultural soil. <laughs> um, but, and then they also learn to love it. So, um, so with that, just to conclude, you know, the importance of integrating cultural values um, into land management policy and law is so important. Um, and, and so, you know, we hope that the data that we collect using, you know, our biophysical tools can, can help to contribute to that. Um, and again, sort of integrating these different knowledge systems, um, you know, so that our land use planning can be community determined and really look towards the long term. And so with that, um, you know, just acknowledge all the folks that I've talked to that I've worked with, especially with the Egg Forum. Um, really, really great group of people. And uh, with that, miigwech.